I just had something pop, pop in my heart as I stepped on the stage. Uh, what we're going to be talking about, why I'm, I'm sure in my heart to talk for the next couple of weeks, because it's what we're going to kick off talking about on our small group Wednesday um, in our small groups, and that is talking about the goodness of God. And what popped into my heart was this Malachi chapter 3. And it says in that though, Malachi chapter 3, verse 16, this is um, right after where he talks about, you know, it doesn't pay to serve the Lord. And he talks about, well, what, what are you talking about? How have we, you know, anyway, and he talks about tithes and offerings and all that kind of stuff. But then it says that those who uh, feared the Lord and, and they saw his goodness is really what it comes down to. It says this, at that time, those who feared the Lord, Lord spoke to one another. They spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So your, wor- your words and my words, they matter, don't they? God's listening to what we're talking about. And they spoke to one another, um, and it says this, and the Lord heard them, the Lord listened and heard them. So the scroll of remembrance was written before him regarding those who feared the Lord and honored his name. Who honored his name, or who basically was like, God, man, God has been good. God's been good to us. Can you believe how good God's been good? And God listened, and he heard, and he wrote some things down, and he re- remembered. So we're going to talk tonight and over the next uh, two Wednesdays on just the goodness of God. I had a lot of different, um, a different uh, you, we could have called tonight mercy. We could have called tonight the love of God. I, I, I titled tonight's message, He Loves Me, or God Loves Me. God loves me. Did you know God loves you? God loves you uh, so much, and uh, it's one of these messages that sometimes can become um, maybe lost in, in, in coming to church, just how good God is, how good God is. Uh, um, in, in Lamentations, it says this, that it, it, God's, it's, it's because of his mercies that we're not consumed. It tells us that his mercies are new every morning. That word there is compassion. It's his love. It's his love. It's, it's, it's who he is. It's his mercy, his love, and why we're not consumed. It's not because of our righteous deeds. It's simply because of his love. And that's a powerful thing to think. God love, it's God's love that causes you and me not to be consumed. His love. In the New Testament, where you jump over into Greek and you look up that word, the word mercy, it means covenant loyalty. That's what the word mercy means. And when you see it in the New Testament, where it talks about blessed are those who are merciful. Like when you see mercy, those who extend a covenant loyalty, the same loyalty and kindness, covenant loyalty that God extended to you. Blessed are those who are extend that same thing that God extended to you, that you would extend that to others. He said, you'll receive that covenant loyalty as well. You remember that scripture that talks about, and we'll jump into notes here in a moment, but you remember the scripture that talks about who this guy that was forgiven, it's a scripture, really a parable, a guy that was forgiven of this great debt, and then this, he, he goes to the guy, he, guy that owes him a little bit of money and has him thrown into prison. And, 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 and the Lord uses this parable to say, throw him in, you know, back into prison until he can pay what he owes. In other words, the Lord's saying, listen, if you can't forgive, the way I forgive you, don't expect to receive the forgiveness, you know. And so here's what he's saying when he, in Matthew, he talks about the, the blessed are those who are merciful or, or, or extend covenant loyalty, the, the way that God treated me, for they shall receive covenant loyalty. So just talking tonight, we're going to talk tonight about just the love of God. Really, it's a carryover of Sunday's message. How many of you are here for Easter, right? Like, and, and the title of Sunday's message was this, and I'm, I'm kind of like stirred in my heart to talk. So you, I'm talking really fast because I've got like so much, and we might even just repeat it all next week. Maybe not. But it's just, it's important. You know, I titled on Sunday's message, um, I Found Jesus. I, I, I switched back and forth on Sunday between I Found Jesus or I Saw Jesus. I Found Jesus or I Saw Jesus. And I switched it like, probably six times, actually, to where the booth was probably like, I don't even know which one to put on there because I was in there changing it on them, and I'm like, I don't even know what it hit. But I ended up with I Found Jesus because, and we talked a little bit about Zacchaeus, right? And I talked, really, it was a message of the love of God and, some, and really to the church. Um, and so many times we think we're the ones that found Jesus when Jesus was really the one that found us. And we didn't come except for he drew us, right? And so we looked at Zacchaeus and how Zacchaeus, uh, how he, um, in his heart, he wanted to be accepted. He wanted, and within, every, within humanity, we, were, we are a creation. 
that was created by our Creator, and there is a drawing and a longing within man. Kind to, 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 toward their creator. To be, there's, a, there's a drawing, a longing. And so here's Zacchaeus. He wants to be, to, 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 to see this Jesus. Could it be in like what he's heard? How many of you know that Jesus, people heard, it talks about how his fame spread. How many of you know a fame spread across the, the, all, all the side? Like people heard about this Jesus. This, who's this Jesus that's healing? Who's this Jesus that's redeeming? Who's this Jesus that didn't cast a stone at the woman? She was naked, and, and he's like down there all up next to her, and he's like, and, and, and he's drawing in the sand, and, and, and everybody leaves, and, you, and she leaves, and she's restored. Like who is this Jesus? Right, like this just spread, and 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 it was there was Jesus. Sometimes, how many of you know that rumors spread also, not just good news. So as much as Jesus' fame spread because he was good, Jesus' fame spread because Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes did not like him at all, because that messed with their righteousness. It messed with who they were. It messed with how they walked down the street because that just meant a common man who didn't have it all together could be accepted by God, our Father, the Father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whom we serve, whom we have our na- at the table, whom we are. You know, like that was that just jacked with them. That they, they didn't like it at all. And so here, here's this message that's given by Jesus, and his fame is spreading because of his deeds and his words, and so is in his notoriety, but also his shame, or in a sense, a shaming of this Jesus. So people heard about him. Not always good. Okay? And so, we're, we're, again, tonight we're talking about um, just seeing Jesus, finding Jesus. He loves me. And so I wanted to jump into... Uh, uh, into a, a next guy, another guy. We're going to look at another guy. And I, I really want to talk about, because we're talking about the love of God, I want to talk about somebody we've maybe heard a lot about, and we heard a lot about their faith. And this is Centurion. And I'm going to make this, make this statement <clears throat> and, and tonight, because um, we, we heard a lot about the Centurion's faith, and we hear Jesus say, uh, I've not seen faith like this in all of Israel, right? So like, Scribes, Pharisees, uh, Sadducees, like everybody, everybody, he, he, this man. And so we had, he had great faith, but I'll tell you what he had that we don't talk a lot about because you cannot have great faith without great hope. You can't have great faith without great hope because faith is the substance of what you're hoping for. So I'll tell you this, as much as Jesus had been known and had been going around the countryside and his name had spread, this centurion recognized Jesus as a man of authority, but he, he saw Jesus speak to things and things change. He saw healing happen. He saw the centurion heard and seen Jesus' work. He, and what he saw, as he saw him work, he was proving his character. The centurion actually was proving the character of Jesus and who he was. And so, in a sense, he saw Jesus. He found Jesus. And when he found Jesus, he found hope. And when he was in a place, he knew where to go. And he knew, I just need his word because I know his character. But if he didn't know Jesus' character, could he have just said, only speak the word? No, he couldn't have just said, just speak the word. He knew something about him. He observed something about him. He believed something about this man, Jesus. That he was from the Lord. That that he was was a great man of God. That that, that, that knees bowed. Demons fleed. Eyes were open. He knew something. He saw a character about him. He saw mercy. He saw goodness. He saw kindness. He saw some. He saw God. He saw God. That's what Zacchaeus saw. He saw God. When he was looking for Jesus, you know what he saw? He saw God. He saw his goodness. 
How do we know he saw his goodness? The Bible tells us in Romans, it is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. And what was Zacchaeus' statement to Jesus, though Jesus said nothing to him? He said, Lord, everything that I have, I'm giving back to the poor. And if I've ever taken advantage, I'm giving four times, not just double, I'm four times the amount back. That's a complete change of ways. How do you, what, what happened? Goodness. He saw goodness. He saw God. And so tonight, I, I really want to talk about uh, you and I seeing the mercy and the goodness of God in our day-to-day lives. You know, we've said this before here. If you want to see God moving, start seeing God move. Um, he's there. He's moving all the time. Matter of fact, uh, he's doing so much more than you think he is. God is always doing more than you think he is. Right now, God is moving on your behalf <clears throat> because his mercies are new today. Did you know his, his covenant loyalty towards you and the way he's going to deal towards you, not based upon you, but based upon him. That's crazy. Like that just is crazy. He's going to be good to me, not because I was good, but just simply because he's good. He's going to, wait, hold on, hold on. He's going to be covenantly loyal to me. He's going to, it says this in, in Genesis, he cut, cut, or maybe this is in Hebrews or Romans, but it happened in, in Genesis. I think it's in Genesis and, and recounted, but the story of Abraham in Romans. I'm, I'm, I don't know exactly where it's found, but let me just give you this word, okay? It's this. God cut covenant with himself because he could swear by no greater. And he's not a man that he could lie. Okay? So it's, it's, it's found in a couple of places. You see it when he cut covenant with himself when Abraham fell asleep and he split the animals and God passed through. God, God's covenant with you and me, he cut covenant with himself. And then when he sent Jesus, he sent Jesus as, as a son of man, but yet son of God, man, so he could cut covenant with himself. And then he declared a covenant to you. This is how I'm going to treat you. This is what I'm going to do for you. This is how I'm going to act toward you. This is how I'm going to act toward the world. This is how I'm going to act toward even the Pharisees that I wanted and and everyone that I would love to gather under my wings. The one at the cross, like just... We were watching The Passion uh, just this weekend, and, and last night we were starting to finish, and I fell asleep again. Um, just honest, just fell asleep again, which is kind of crazy because, you know, it's kind of a, it's really a great movie, right? Um, or really a story. And, and uh, Evan was talking this morning, we were talking about the movie, and she's like, no, you fell asleep like at this time. I'm like, I did, I thought I saw it up to this. But I opened my eyes a few different times. And she said... Uh, and she said, no, it was before uh, Jesus was on the cross, and, uh, and this, this Roman centurion was, like, hurling insults at him. And, and the guy on the cross next to him looks, at him looks at Jesus and looks down at the centurion and says, hey, he's praying for you. Jesus is on the cross. The guys are each side of the cross, hanging there next to him. Being, insults are still being hurled upon Jesus. Jesus is praying for the centurion. This man sees Jesus praying for the guy hurting him, and he says, bro, he's praying for you. He's on here for you while you're doing that. And we wonder about our prayers being answered. He who would not spare his own son, how would he also not freely give you all things? So I want to start tonight's, really, tonight's message this way. In James chapter 3, we've been talking for the last little bit. So I just gave you a lot of background of my heart and just kind of set the stage. But now we're jumping into the message, all right? So <clears throat> over the last nine weeks... We've been listening to a message uh, about words. How many of you know words are important? So we've been exercising that, right? Being doers of the word, not hearers only, so we don't deceive ourselves. So we've been exercising that. How many of you have caused, uh, maybe these messages have caused a check in your words? 
how you talk about somebody, how you don't talk about somebody, what you say or don't say, right? Like it's kind of like, or if you do say it and you're like, I just want to be mad like Landon, right? Um, right? You're just like, well, at least I'm not going to say that. Or if, then if you get called out on that by your wife or your, somebody that loves you, right, or your husband, um, you, you might say, well, I chose those words on purpose. And your heart's going, yeah, uh-huh. And you're going to repent on purpose too, aren't you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it, it, it's been important, right? And so I just want to draw out this one little um, point. And again, what we're talking about um, in our small groups, really, it's going to be uh, in, in the coming weeks where you're going to see on week three. And then just as we meet in homes, we're just going to talk about the word. We're going to talk about the word that the Holy Spirit's been talking to you. Like, while, while the word's coming forth, there are, there's 60 different messages, 100 different, 200 different messages going forth right now. Right to you. Right to where you're at. And there's life. There's teaching. There's insight. There's all these things. There's counsel. And so, um, and we're going to be talking about this. And so, over the, or, uh, as we, the first thing we're going to be talking about, really, I believe we're going to be just simply talking about the love of God and his mercy and his kindness. And that's what I put my hope and my faith and my trust in. So in James chapter 3, it says this. If we put bits in a horse's mouth and we make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are large and are driven by strong winds, they steer, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set afire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body. It sets the course of the one's whole life um, on fire. It's set on fire by hell. Okay, all right. So here's what we see. And just let me say it this way. Uh, this is the point I want to get to tonight. Is this words change your point? Words change where you point your face. Words as a ship. Words change, or a rudder changes the point or the, its direction. So a ship, you just saw this just recently, uh, when the steering was out or whatever happened in, in um, the, a couple different times, I think Oklahoma, something happened where the barge hit the bridge recently. There was also a barge that hit. Either the steering was on purpose and it pointed that way, or the steering was out. And so because the steering was out, it pointed that way. In other words, the point or the direction of that ship was solely based upon the rudder. Okay? So let's put it this way. My eyes are turned by the words I hear. It's, uh, it's pretty simple, right? So if you're over here and I say, hey, Rodney, Rodney is going to be like, like just a word, right? So your words can steer your life. But how many of you know other people's words can turn your head? Other people's words can be like, you son of a gun. And you're like, like you're just walking around. They, they, uh, some, somebody can give you a word with a, a finger driving down the road. And it can, it can change your point of view. It can change your head. And it can cause you to chase them down. Anybody ever been in something like we just a little, maybe not super long, but just long enough, I'll teach you something, right? You know what I'm talking about, huh? You ever had that happen in the car? Yeah, you want to get them back, don't you? Who do they think they are? Words change. Somebody else's words can, can very much change where you're looking. And so, um, and the devil knows this. Because words change where you look. Your words, you're going to direct your life. <laughs> my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. Your wife says, hey, did you see that bill we just got? What? I thought you paid this. No, 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 I didn't have this paid yet. I said this. Well, I thought I planned all this. I wouldn't have done that if I would have known that you hadn't done that. Somebody else's words just change. Satan knows this. Yeah. Satan knows that your words can change your point of view, but other people's words can turn your head as well. And, uh, and you know what's crazy is when words turn your head, 
it's, it's amazing how it also changes where we expect to receive from. We, we, a word is said, and now we're, we're looking to receive what's next or what's going to happen next or how we're going to respond. Or, and so words are important, okay? So <clears throat> I want to put up this um, a picture. I gave it to you. I should have told you that early on. It's in an email that I did just pretty last minute. <laughs> Come on, let's give Brad a hand. You're the man. All right, this is, uh, this is a lock and dam picture, Okay. Uh, have you ever felt locked up? You know, if you've ever been in a lock and dam, it's cement walls. Everywhere you look, you're locked in. There's no way out. If you, there's, there's no way out. Uh, if you're on the bottom side of the river, I wish I would have had my laser pen that Caleb brought home. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, but on the right side of the screen here, you're going to see a lower portion. Okay? The middle part would be the representation of the lock. Okay? And then the other side, the upper gate, is actually part of the, all this is part of the dam. It's a lock and dam system, all right? And so the reason that there are locks and dams is not, it's, it's, it's for navigation on the river. Uh, there is a fall in a river. And so if you don't raise the water level of a certain stretch of river to a certain height by damming it up, so you're backing the water up so it's deep enough so that the channels or, the, or it's navigable. Or you can navigate a ship. And so then it'll drop down. And then, you know, so you do a whole lot of fall in just a little bit of time. So you can coast all level ground. So that river is like a lake at that point. In a sense, it's just level. So that's how, that's how they, they navigate, even though we're dropping sea level, in a sense. You know, if you were to say, what's the elevation? Well, the elevation over on this piece of land is a lot higher than it is further downstream. But how is the stream able to be navigated? They dam it up to make that level. And then they drop it through a lock and dam. Right? So it's cool. Cool little le- science lesson there if you ha- didn't know. Um, <clears throat> but you will always be locked in if you're looking to draw from below. See, you can't fill up, you can't fill up the center reservoir. You can't get over the dam. You can't get over the dam. The cement walls of life, the hard things in life, if you're drawing from down here. See, because you got to get, something has to lift you up, and you're pulling from something that is down low and has no power to push you above where you need, where you need to go. So you're going to have to draw from something up above. This is a, a lock and dam system. We're in a lock and dam system, <laughs> dam system quite often. You've been there, right? We're in this system. We're like, I don't know how to get over this. I can't figure this out. And I'm looking and I'm banging my head against the walls and, 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 the, and I'm hearing words where I came from. I'm looking all around. I can't seem to see. But, but on the other side of the wall, see, because here's where, here's like, like if I'm trying to get over something, I've come from here. I've, I've come from here. I'm trying to get, but what has to happen is there's a, there's a release or an open door. To, that something that opens the door from above. Now, I, this is what I want to really talk about tonight is knowing how much God loves you. Drawing on his love. Filling up on the love of God. Filling up on the love of God will put you over in every obstacle in life. If you'll fill up on the thing from above. The thing, what I'm talking about, filling up on the love, the love of God. Romans chapter 15, verse 4, it says this, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that for, through perseverance and encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. We might have hope. We might have this expectation of good. There's something that fills our heart when we know how much God loves us. And all these scriptures that are before, they're proving to us the character of God, but also they're proving to us um, how much greater God's love is and God's portion is than man's part. Like that, that's, that's everywhere. So there's hope because of who God is, not because of my... Thank you, Lord. Okay. Um, and so the centurion, we, we, we saw this, and I'm going to go ahead and go there. Uh, I've seen your character. Uh, now I just need your word. That's what he said. I mean, that's what he said. I've seen your character. Now I just need your word. 
And, you know, we're not looking at the character of God when we're looking at all down here, are we? Our head's turned, isn't it? We're not drawn from where we need our help from. Well, we, we lift our... To the valley. No, no, we lift our eyes. Why? Because that's where our help comes from. So, so when you... This would be a good exercise, as much as we're talking about what we're, how we're talking in our mouth and all these words. How about just like, let's just do this. Let's just, let's just practice this tonight. I live from help. You're, you're my help. Like just help. Just like, just like a child. Help. Just learning to just, you got a bad report? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Yeah, but this, uh, thank you, Lord. Just lift your eyes. Lift your eyes. You'll get over the dam. You'll get over the dam situation. You'll get over the dam walls. You'll get over the dam. All of the, you'll get over the lock. You'll get over the, the, the health. You'll get over the adversity. You'll get over the, all the junk. Because you, you get to see the Lord. I saw the character. Now I just need your word. See, as you look, you're gonna, you, what you'll find is you'll, you'll have the Holy Spirit speak to you. And he'll say, he'll speak to your heart. And you'll get what? You'll get a word that turns and keeps your head and yeah. right there. Okay, so um, would you just enter Capernaum, a centurion, ask them. Just again, we're just hitting this quick. Asking for help. Asking for help. He must have known it's going to come from there. Because I, I, I know that guy. He's a helper. I know his character. I know that guy. It's like, if you're going to come to my house, we're probably going to eat something. Like, yeah, let's eat something. Let's, oh, I'm going to ask you, if you come over to my house and you're a young kid, I'm probably going to ask you, what's your favorite food? Like every young kid is probably, like, what do you like to eat? Like breakfast. I don't know why, but I like to just know what people like to eat because I like to like eat food too. <laughs> Like, let's, let's unite. All right? All right. Oh, thank you, Lord. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, I'll come and heal him. Can't you, can't you just know that he knew that that was going to be his response? No, I, hey, hey, hey. Centurion replied, Lord, I don't need you to, to come to my roof, under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, the soldiers with me. I tell this one to go and he goes and that one come and he comes. And so I say to my servant, do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he said, wow, wow, look at this. Truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I'll say it again this way. Truly, I've not seen somebody in Israel that has held such great hope. He was inspecting. See, centurions at that time, they were placed and stationed to watch over those people. In a sense, to keep, not only keep the peace, but to rule. And that, so you were, when somebody would have got, gained traction of notoriety or influence, they were a person of suspicion. So he had to watch them in depthly, in depthly. And this man, he was over people. So he would have, this is, I mean, it would be good to put you and me in our, our imagination to work a little bit as we read the scriptures. And it wouldn't be so boring. It would be like watching the chosen. And you would have a little bit of Holy Spirit and creative liberty in your own heart and in your own imagination as God would place before you his love and his kindness and the way he would move and work. And you would see in the story that's only a few words, which is actually people's whole lives in just a moment of what's actually happening. And this man, this centurion, is stationed and had over guards and over and then been watching Jesus. And hope has risen in his heart because he saw who Jesus was. So this man, though he has a man of great faith, it was because he was a man of great hope or man of great trust in the character or what he's seen Jesus do. So he got to look at the heart of God. So I would just say this. Let's look tonight. We're going to look at the heart of God and let hope be stirred again. You know, you got anything you're hopeless for? You know, uh, maybe you've been looking at a few things. 
too long. Maybe some other words have gotten in, into your my heart. I don't know if that, that's ever happened to you, but when my awareness causes me to hopeless, I better check where I'm getting my information. When, when, when my awareness actually causes me to have less hope, Less trust in the character and the goodness of God. I loved uh, last week when, um, when Brother Keith, or maybe it was the week before, he said, when, when I'm dealing with my, maybe you're dealing with your son and he's doing this and this and God's teaching him something. How can you say God's teaching your kid something when he's blah, 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 blah? Because of the character of God. He's never going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. He's, out, he's always coming after you. He's teaching my son something right now. God's teaching my son something right now. Wow. How can you say that? You can say that because you trust the Lord. Because you know his character. So we're going to let hope be stirred again. Hebrews chapter 10, 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus... So the blood of Jesus made a way for you and I to come in. The most holy place. The place that you couldn't go. The place that we couldn't go. We were not worthy to enter. The blood of Jesus made a way. By the new and living way. That's, that's like what we just celebrated on Easter Sunday. Right? Like the new and living way. Not just a, a, a lamb that has passed away like a Passover. But a new and living way. Jesus, who whoever lives, we talked about this Sunday, he ever lives. He's always living. He will forever live to intercede on your and my behalf. What does it mean to intercede? To stand in the gap? To say, hey, let's get them some help. Hey, we could do this. Hey, hey. This is Jesus, a new who's ever lives to intercede. By, so now we come in by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open to us through the, cur- uh, through the curtain that is his body. Okay? Jesus' body, he says, And since we have this great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance. Full assurance of faith. Hmm. Full assurance. Confident expectation of good. Full assurance. Fully assured of faith. Like It's like hope. It's the picture and the word. It's the picture and the promise. It's the character and the word. Right? It, it's... it's it's like you could know that like if you came to my house hungry, hopefully you would know that you're going to probably get something to eat. You would have that hope. It's dinner time. He likes to eat too. I have hope. That, but if I say come to my house to get a steak at 7, now you have faith. Because you got my word. But before you had hope, you showed up there that he's going to probably I look hungry. Gosh, I'm hungry. I'm going to find a way. But he has full assurance. So we go, let's go. Since we have this great piece of Let's draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having a heart sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You know, God doesn't want your and my awareness to be of ourselves, but of him. That, that's amazing. To stand in awe of, like that our conscience, even our conscience, is to be, oh God, thank you. Like my awareness, just, it just drowns out all the other. He said, now let us hold, let us hold or not be moved, okay? Like holding the direction of a ship. Let us keep our rudder or keep our eyes or keep resolutely unbending, unyielding. So let us hold unyieldingly, okay, to the hope. Let's keep looking, having an expectation of good of what we professed. Like you and I, there should be a hope. In, you, in us, based upon God's love for us. He says this, um, why? Why? why should we hold to that hope? For he who promised is, does it matter that God's faithful? Does it matter what we believe about his faithfulness? It does if you want to have hope. If you want to, you know what, so many times the lack of joy is because of lack of hope. If you're not laughing like you should be, if you don't have joy in your house like you should, we've all been there where we're like, I don't like the status of my house right now. Like, I don't like, I don't like the arguing. I don't like the hopelessness. 
I don't like the lack of joy. Or I don't like the lack of joy. I don't like the, it's because you have a, the wrong picture. In some way, you have a picture of lack. You have a picture of hurt. You have a picture of division or separation. You have a picture of something. And so you're laughing. It won't exist because the picture is wrong. It'll be, or your laugh will be just so short. It won't be, it won't be true and deep. And God wants your, his house to be filled with laughter. He wants your house to be filled with laughter. But that can only happen when your heart is filled with hope. So let's keep on going. Again, because when you're filled up, when you fill up on the love of God, because he loves me, because God loves me, all of a sudden, these different words, they don't affect you so much. God loves me. And, and there's a joy there. There's a hope there. Okay? Um, and so he's faithful to his promise. And let us consider how to, I think this is interesting, how he tells us to hold on to hope. Hold on to God's faithfulness. When, when does he tell us to do this? And what's the context of even this verse? As you see the day approaching. Is there anything, any news that's hit anybody lately, any words that has turned your head and maybe produced hopelessness? I saw a shirt um, that, that said uh, um, something about, uh, I may be old, but at least I saw America before it went to blank. In other words, there's a saying, that, per, that shirt said, basically said, I may be 80 years old, but at least I got to see America in its glory days because right now we're hopeless and it's not going to ever come up. Anybody heard anything lately that might have produced some hopelessness? Anybody ever heard a word of God that doesn't produce hope? Can I even tell you about prophecy? Like, wait, let's, let me, I wonder about this. He is the one who makes the way when there is no way. But there's no way... This is doom, 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 doom. Even though your heart's like, God, I don't know how. Doom. Uh-huh. Gloom. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's, not, it's not a word. Any, let's just go back to what the seed produces. The fruits of the Spirit are fear. No, wait. Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23. What are the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace. Okay. Look at the fruit. Look at the fruit. I remember there, there, in the distant past here, there was a message that, shared, that was shared, and it seemed to just bring about just very great fear. You know? Have you ever been there? Have you ever listened to a message, and it just made you scared? It scared the snot out of you. Just, what, well, you didn't hear it of the right spirit. You can read the Word of God. I can use the Word of God. In the wrong spirit. And it not minister the fruit of the spirit. So it's, it's not just about what word's spoken. It's about the spirit that it's spoken in. It matters. It matters. Is it, what is it producing in me? And so sometimes it's not what is spoken, but it's the filter that I'm hearing through. Like, the pastor could share a message with a pure heart to, to bring hope and to encouragement and all of those kind of things that is straight from the Lord. But your filter is one not of the Lord. Your eyes have been fixed. Your ears have been fixed on a lot of other things. And so your head is hearing that word through a different filter. But if you turn your head back to where your help comes from and recognize that there is hope because he loves you and, and we know he loves us in his will, how he wouldn't even spare his own son, how much more will he also freely give to you whatever it is that you ask? This is in Matthew. Wow. That's pretty powerful. So he says this, that we're to hold to hope that we professed because he's faithful. And he says it in the context to, that we should spur one another on, on to love and good deeds. Let us not neglect meeting together as some have made a habit, but let us encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. That just tells me this, that people, as you see the day of the Lord's return approaching, they're going to get discouraged. They're going to need somebody to kind of jar them a little bit, a little poke, a little prod, a little, come on, buddy, a little attaboy. All right, all right, okay, I'm going, all right, we're going to get there. 
you know, in, in love, right? In, on to love and to good. So that's interesting. So faith is attached to God's word, but hope is attached to his character. Faith is attached to God's word, but hope is attached to his character or his mercy. Who, who is God? Let's just define, give me one word. God is? Oh. That's like the, the predominant prevailing statement. You could have said God is righteous. You could have said God is holy. You could have said God is? You could have said a lot of things, but, but what we see him define himself as like oh, multiple, multiple, multiple times and how he's demonstrated his love for us and how he, it's love or compassion. Or let's say it this way, that word that we said, his mercies, his compassion are new every day. It's his mercy, his covenant loyalty. So this is where hope rests. This is where its foundation is. It's in his covenant loyalty or his love for us. Ephesians chapter 2, 11 through 13. Let's look at this. This is really powerful. Therefore, remember that formerly you were the Gentiles by birth and called the uncircumcision. In other words, you had no covenant. Remember that you had no covenant? Gentiles by birth called uncircumcised by those who called themselves the circumcision, which is done by the body and human hands. In other words, you you, you were on the outside looking in. Next verse. Remember that at that time, you were separate from Christ. Remember, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, and without what? You were without hope. It's important for us to remember that we were without hope. There was no way. There was no way over the, the wall. There was no way above. There was no way for us. There was no way we could not get ourselves clean. We could not, as hard as we tried, we had access, no way to get to what was bigger than us. But God stepped in and put us over what is too hard. Now, nothing is impossible with him. Like, this is, this is the truth. When, when you get with him, when you remember, wait a minute, wait a minute. He, God is for me, and if God is for me, who can be against me? We're going to see that. But look at this. He says, remember, call to, call to your remembrance that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of promise. And so, because you had no covenant, you had no hope. God's mercy is his covenant loyalty. You can have hope because of the mercy and the character and the love of God This is why you can have hope, covenant loyalty. And without God in this world, you and I were without. Now it says this, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Remember the blood of Christ. What is the blood of Christ? It's the picture of his love towards us. It's the way that he made when there was no way. And let me say, if he made a way when there was no way there, Just as he said in Matthew, he who did not spare his own son, how will he also not freely give you all things? If you ask for a fish, is he going to give you a snake? If you ask for a bread, is he going to give you a stone? See, hope asks for feisty things. When you have hope, like when you're a kid, when your little kid has hope, and you know, it's always like this. I got three boys. The older ones, when there's a big ask, you know, They're always like, get the younger one to go ask because he still has that little bit of hope that dad or mom, they might say yes. He still has that hope. So faith is a child. Can I tell you that faith is a child? When Jesus says you you need to have faith like a child, you know what they have? They have less awareness of all the things around them. So you know what they have? They have hope that it could be. As the way that they think, because they don't realize that all of that is what it took to get that. They just are like, no, that's, that's great. Look at that. Uh-huh. That's right. yeah. Good. But now in Christ Jesus, you were once so far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Romans 8, 28 through 39. And we know that God works all things together for good. For those who love him, called according to his purpose. Do you know that? Well, why are you so hopeless? Did he call you? Do you remember you were without hope, but he brought you into a place of hope through Christ. 
So we know that God works things together for good. Hey, God's working it all together for good right now. But well, something changes, doesn't it? Something changes in my countenance. Something changes in my heart. Something changes in my joy. Something changes in my look when I know God is working right now. God is always working on more than you think. God is always working on more than you can see. Oh, that's good. Thank you, Lord. Love him, call according to his purpose, for God foreknew. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Oh, there's so much here. He called you by name. He justified. You're justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Glorified like, like me? Okay, all right. What shall we say in response to all those things? So what are you going to say? Because we, we were talking about saying the right words for the last nine weeks. So what should we say? What are you going to say to the response to the things? Well, I'll tell you what you'll say. God loves me. He's for me. Like it changed. You're not looking for something, trying to figure out what to say. You have something to say. God's for me. God's for me. Thank you, Lord. Lord, thank you. You're for me. You, you know where to look. You know where to lift your head. You, you, you recognize the character, just like the centurion. God's for me. He's for people. He loves the sinner. He loves this. He loves the guy on the outside. He loves this. I don't have to be on the inside. I don't have to be this. I don't have to have everything. I don't. He loved, the centurion had no right. And yet he had the greatest faith because he watched. He observed the love of God. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. This is what Jesus said. This is what Jesus demonstrated. He was the living image of God, the love of God here on this earth. Wow. So what are you going to say in response to me? God's for me. So what could stand against me? Well, there's a big wall. That's all right, because I'm drawn from a source that's so much greater that's above. I'm not limited here. Like, i got to remember that I was limited here, but God. So I lift up my eyes to where my help comes from. And he's a maker. He's a creator. I love that. He's the maker of heaven and earth. What does he say? And how did he make heaven and earth? So in the word that is spoken is the power to perform or the power to create or the power to change right. dark to light. That's right. That's right. So, man, words matter. Yeah. So the words I hear and the words I say and what I say in response to these things and what I believe, whether or not I believe, is God for me? Or is it based upon how I've done and how I haven't done? Because no one is more aware of what you haven't done than you. And so that's, that, that is the cap so often because even on your best day, you only can go just this far in what he'll do for you based upon your works. Oh, guys, we could be here a lot longer tonight um, because we're, uh, <laughs> praise the Lord. You know, we're going to go, we're going to pick up here next week too. And, um, but I want to, I want to go to one, one, one verse or one, oof. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Um, hmm. mm. We are a long ways from get going anywhere. Um, so hope's a vision thing. It's based on where your head is turned. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're just going to stay in, in this, finish reading the More Than Conquerors, um, uh, Romans chapter 8. It's a great passage. We read it Sunday, and that's where we're going to end up this tonight. What shall we say in response to these things? God's for me. Who can be against me? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, what will he do? But you're going to have to, re- you're going to, have to earn it just like you earned salvation. Oh, no. Wait, no, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. By grace are you saved through faith. So the avenue is you and I to believe, but the only way you and I can believe is if we truly have hope to believe. Like, wait a minute. You heard the story, for God so loved 
So you heard about his love, which allows you to believe and then receive, not earn, what he's offering. And that is salvation by grace through faith. That's it. So let's get our, get our, get our hopes back up. Let's just, just remember this. He loves you. If God loves me, what am I going to say to something? What am, what am I going to say? What am I, what, where, where am I going to look? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? Who will, it is God who justifies. Man, this deals with everything. When you're accused. When you're accused, what does God say? What does God say about you? Who is there to condemn us? For Christ Jesus, who died and more than that was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and he is interceding for us. Man, he is there saying, this guy, he's righteous. This guy, he's holy. This guy, he's not done anything wrong. This guy, there's not a spot on him. He's white as snow. This guy, there is not sin to be found anywhere near him as far as the east is from the west. This guy is your son. This guy is your son. So, what do you think we could do for your favorite one and only? Looks just like you. Son. Well, have you been grafted in? Are you a part? In, are you in Christ? Because if any man is in Christ, the old has passed away, the new has come. You were once a caterpillar, you're right. You were once a sinner. But never do you see a butterfly and go, wow, look at that caterpillar with wings. Who, does anybody say that? No. You say butterfly. And that's what you are. You're made new. Into his very image and likeness. Wait, wait. Into his image and likeness. And you are the body of... Okay. Wow. So he's interceding on your and my behalf. And this is what he's saying. And you're saying, oh, that sounds like too good to be true. That, no, that sounds the good news. You owed a big debt, but he came to proclaim that you're the Lord. You're broken hearted, but he healed. He's the, like, how does he gonna, like, he, he's on the, like, how can he just come in and heal what he did wasn't a part of, like, he's God. Because he has, he draws from a place that we aren't familiar with too, far too often. Heaven. Is there, uh, let me ask you this. Let's just talk about praying for the sick. You think heaven has, an extra whatever's needed? Parts? Pieces? Words? You don't need parts, just words. See, the words create the parts. So, so many times we're looking for things and all he's looking for is someone to only speak the word, but you can only speak the word if you hold the hope. You can only speak the word if you hold the the hope. So what are we going to say to these things? Nothing if we don't hold hope. What are we going to say to these things? Nothing, because we know how important our words are. You know, what are you going to say to these things? Nothing. Why? Because you're not holding hope. Because some word has turned your head, and it's got you, and the enemy knows that words will turn your and my head and get you and me looking somewhere else, and we'll know enough not to say, and we'll keep our head down, and we'll grind through, and our hope will be robbed, and our joy will be robbed, and our strength will be weak, and what we'll have is no expectation of what tomorrow and God has prepared for those that love him. Instead, we're going to have to try to figure out what we can do and how we can figure it out. And we're going to look around and we're going to draw from what we got instead of simply lifting our eyes. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. You love me. Yeah. You're taking care of this. Thank you that you love me. Thank you, Lord. And you care for what my heart cares for. Exactly. You know, for your kids, for your body, for your health, for your love. You need words. 
So what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Well, it was probably, what was it? What's going to separate you from the love of Christ? No. Not from his love. Nothing can separate you from that. Shall trouble or distress or persecution or famine? No. Nakedness, danger, or sword. In any of these, any of these times, you can call on the love of Christ. You can, in the, based on the character of God, you could say, just all I need is a word. All I need is a word, Lord. Just give me the word. Just give me a word. I know your character. I know your character. I just need a word about this famine. I know your character. I just need a word about this trouble. I know your character. I just need your word about this eclipse. I know your character. I just need your word about this election. I know your character. I just need your word about whatever this is. I know your character. I just need your word about how to do this situation or about my child. And I'm going to say your word. I'm going to come into agreement and release your word here on this earth because your word is what creates. And at that very time, my servant was made well. But, it, but it, was it just the word or was it the word with a foundation in the character and the goodness of God or a foundation that's based on love? Because faith works by love. So if you don't know how much he loves you, it doesn't matter how much word you got. Because it's going to be a form, but no power. So he loves you. And this is the message that you and I are to carry, and this message was given to you and me. This message was given to you and me to go beyond the four walls and preach the message of Christ, not to be some stinking, elite, spiritual group. Garbage. That's vomit. Yuck. Get out of here. Close these doors. Like, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. I was listening to a message from, from oh, probably 13 years ago, which is terrible to do, listen to yourself 13 years ago. <laughs> but you know what I heard? I heard, uh, I heard God wants to see people experience his love. I just heard a heart, my heart coming forth going, let's get outside these walls. And I heard me talking about, it's time we had a name change. We sometimes get into our place and we try to say, oh, well, this is the word and this is the word. And we got another word on the word and on the word and, and the historicity of this and this. And <sighs> Well, I studied this and I studied this. That's great. Have you shared the gospel and prayed with someone to receive Christ? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Or are, are, are we just... Measuring people up and making this some unattainable religion. Jesus came so that the world could experience salvation. To seek and save the lost. Where, when was the last time you looked up into, or instead of down, your nose? Or, you know, like Zacchaeus. Guys. Like, I'm just thinking, like, ah, get, get me around some, you're going to not like what I'm going to say. Let me have somebody cuss around me again. Because I know you won't in church. I'd rather have someone say, oh, that's some good, j-, while I'm preaching. Why not? That's a babe. Where's the crying in the church? Where's the crying in the church? Oh, we know better than the cry in the church. Anyway. So we're going to talk about this. It's small group. Think we got some stuff to talk about? How about to put into action? How about God loves you? He loves me. God loves me. Oh, even when you miss it? Yeah. <laughs> even when I lost it? Yeah, because he came to seek and save the lost. It's, I remember listening to a song. 
So my father, and we're going to pick up Romans 8, the end of this part. We didn't get there, but um, I remember listening to this song my dad would play. Um, and uh, he loved me no matter how I played. He loved me. Anybody heard this song? See, uh, Stephen Annie Chapman? It's, uh, no? Is it? Huh? Yeah. Help me out. Somebody heard this song before. My father would find me and call out my name. He loves me no matter how I played. He loves me. Come on. You've heard this song a hundred times. Yeah. Uh, baseball and car rides. Da, 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 da. Yeah. My dad played it. My dad played this song. He would put this on and just to declare his love for me no matter how I performed. Bob Bennett. Okay. Bob Bennett. I don't know why I got the ad at Chapman. Bob Bennett, he loves me no matter how I played. You might should listen to it. No matter how you do, no matter how you perform, God loves you. Even when you striked out, even when you messed up, even when you, and he loves you. And because he loves you, you call unto him, and he will answer. So let's get our hopes back up. Let's stand tonight. Let's get our hopes up. Let's get a picture. Oh, God, you're so good. You're so good. Let's get a picture of hope back in our heart and a picture of hope. Uh, you talk about what you're hoping for. You, you'll find that I, you're going to hear come out of my heart uh, about a big moose, if you haven't already, because I'm hopeful to go to a, a place and get what my heart desires. So I have an expectation. You're going to talk about it. What are you going to say? You're going to talk about what you're hoping for. Tell me about what you hope. Maybe you're not married and you long for a husband or a wife. Lord, thank you. C can God bring you one? You better believe it. Can I tell you that God's working on more than you think? God is always working on more than you think. What about your child that hasn't come home? He's on his way. Because God's working. God is always doing more than you think. What about you have to go to the doctor for the fourth time to check the status? What about that? God's working. God's working. How can you say that? Because he loves me. Because he loves me. So fill up on the love of God. Father, we just ask you tonight to show us your love that we would say, be able to say with conviction, with just all of our being, God loves me. God loves me. He loves, he loves me. And so from that place, from that foundation of hope, we would receive your word. faith would work. And it wouldn't be this mystical thing. It would be just a simple thing that you designed. That you gave us. Your love. You demonstrated. In your words. So thank you, Father, for filling these people tonight, this house, with hope. Hope for a free mind. Huh. You don't have to always be down. You don't have to always fear. Just imagine what it would be like to trust instead of be tormented. You can trust your wife and you can trust your husband. You don't have to be tormented. You can be free from fear. So imagine what it would be like to not lack anything. Imagine. Begin to imagine. And let God's word turn your head and lift your eyes to where your help comes. And let him fill you up. Fill the reservoir of your heart with his love. And you'll see on a new plane. You'll see that there is a way. Your words will be filled with hope. 
and your heart will rejoice and even your laughter will be contagious. Father, we thank you for hope tonight that we have because we were once without hope, but you gave us Jesus. Thank you for Jesus for sending your only son to die on the cross for us. We declare you, Jesus, as Lord. tonight thank you for making a way when there was no way and that you are the same yesterday today and in our tomorrow we thank you for it in Jesus name amen 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 thank you Lord God bless you guys 8 o'clock there you go 8 o'clock you know normally it was like 8.30 you know 6.30 6.30 came early, so did ending. Um, before we go, I just have this um, come to my heart that I wanted to share. Um, he was speaking out of Romans 8, and it says, um, verse 33 through 34, Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is there to condemn us? For Christ Jesus who died, and more than that, was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and he is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And I just heard that, that um, some of you, the hope is, has been stolen because of condemnation. And that word, you know, he talked about like where your eyes turn. When you're constantly hearing guilty, and, and, and you feel like you're separated from God, there's, then the enemy has just won you over and saying there's no hope. And so for some of you, I heard it's just condemnation. But the Lord spoke this little phrase to me as he was um, reading this verse that the only one who was even worthy to condemn me is interceding for me. So you can tell that to the devil. The only one who's able to condemn me. Someone else on planet earth isn't able to condemn me. The only one who's even worthy or able to bring condemnation toward me is interceding for me. In other words, that's the biggest cheerleader for me. Other people may not be a cheerleader for me, but I have one who's continually interceding for me on my behalf. And I love what that verse says because... It says that he's interceding for us. And then the very next verse says, who shall separate me from the love of God? In other words, the one who would be able to condemn you, the one who would be able to do it, he's not only interceding for you, but you can't even be separated from his love. Isn't that an awesome picture? And so I just saw that, that he's, he's your biggest cheerleader. He's your biggest, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I love this, even preaching Jesus, everyone, everywhere, every day, that that's what we preach. is not condemnation, but what we preach is God's love for you. He's for you. He's for you. He's for you. Amen. Close with this statement. God is on my side, for the blood has been applied. Every need shall be supplied, and nothing will be denied. So I enter into rest. I know that I'm blessed. I have passed the test, and I will get God's best. Why? Because the blood is applied. Amen? Amen. God bless you tonight. You know, if you need agreement in prayer, not just us, but reach out to somebody.